Now, how many of you have one of these books already? If you don't, we've got a bunch of them in the back. This is, I put this book together a number of years ago, several years ago, and what it is, it, it is the whole Bible. Each book is summarized, and then there is an outline for each one of the books in the Bible. So all 67 books are in here. Uh, I was just seeing if you're paying attention. All 66 books are in here. And at the beginning, there are two Bible reading plans to get you through the Bible in one year's time. And, uh, and they're not date specific. So if you miss January 1st, it doesn't matter. There are no dates in here. It's just day one. So you can start middle of January or beginning of February, and you can still make it through in a 12-month period. And so make sure you take one of these books with you. We've got a bunch of them in the back, and, uh, and so those are for uh, yours uh, for the taking and using, right? You can't just take them, but you have to use them as well. Pick out a favorite book. If you don't want to do any of those plans, just pick out a favorite book. You'll see what the book is all about. Read through it. Check it off at the beginning and then go through another. I like to take my time. There's a time and a place for me to go through it in a year, and I do that, but I like to take my time in a book. And so it's a great reminder of what that book is is about. <coughs> Excuse me. But anyway, we're in Matthew chapter 2 this morning. I want to finish out the Christian or the Christmas uh, uh, narratives. And this one is the story of uh, the three wise men, or at least the wise men. Uh, we don't know how many there were. We surmise that there were three because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but we don't know how many. There may have been as less as two. There could have been 15 or 20. We don't know. But anyway, this is the story of the wise men. You remember that only out of the four Gospels, only Matthew and Luke give us detail concerning the narratives of his birth. And so Mark and John, you remember, begin their story, begin their Gospel with John the Baptist and continue on with the life of Christ. But Matthew and Luke give us details concerning his birth. And in this particular chapter, we learn we begin to learn then what happened immediately after his birth. You remember, just to summarize, you remember the angel appeared uh, to Zechariah and, and told him there in the temple that him and his wife uh, would be having a child in spite of their old age, and they did, and his name would be John the Baptist. Six months later, the same angel, Gabriel, appears to Mary uh, and tells her that she would, although being a virgin, at 14 or 15 years of age, probably your age, Jameson, your age, that the angel appeared to Jameson, no, to Mary, and said that she would be having a child and his name would be Jesus. She questioned the angel. The angel said, well, you know what? The Holy Spirit will protect you and will guide you through this process. And so uh, we looked at that several weeks ago. We saw uh, last week their journey to Bethlehem. This uh, decree went out from Caesar to, uh, to register everyone for tax purposes and military purposes. And so uh, Joseph, along with Mary, to escape the wagging tongues there in Nazareth, go to Bethlehem to be registered uh, along with the rest of them were going. Of course, we looked at this uh, also that when they arrived in Bethlehem, there was no room at the Motel 6. Uh, there was no room at all, uh, even at the inn, this primitive inn, the Catalumi, you remember that Greek word? There was no room there, and so they stayed the only place available, and that was in the cattle stall where the animals were kept and the hay and, and everything. And so it would be that evening that Mary would then give birth to Jesus there in that cattle stall. He would be laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough for the animals. I'm sure Joseph cleaned it out first. And the baby would then, Jesus would be placed uh, in that manger. Uh, last uh, Sunday night, Christmas Eve, we looked at the story of the uh, shepherds. Uh, after the birth of Jesus, the, remember the angel appears to the shepherds at nighttime. They're warming their hands by the fire. And all of a sudden, the angel appears and the light shines around about them and tells them and announces to them the arrival of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, heaven is peeled back and the heavenly host of angels were saying, glory to God in the highest 
and on earth peace, good will toward men. The angels get up and then they rush to the manger scene, and it was exactly as it was, was the message was given to them. There was the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying there in that feeding trough. They went back to tell everyone. Uh, the good news, the great news of the arrival of the Messiah. What we didn't go over is eight days later, Jesus would be circumcised, probably at the local synagogue there in Jerusalem. And then on the 40th day, as was required by their law, they would go then go to Jerusalem and Jesus would be dedicated. And it was there that Simeon, uh, who had been told that he would not see death until he had seen the Messiah. Jesus then meets Simeon. Also Anna, the prophetess, she was told that she would not see the Messiah, or she would not die before she would see the Messiah, and she did. And so Mary and Joseph then would go back probably to Bethlehem. They would not return uh, to Nazareth because of the supposed um, mistake of her being pregnant without being married, and so they wanted to escape the wagging tongues. They would not go there, and so they would stay then for the next year or two in the town of Bethlehem. And so this is where this particular story picks up in chapter 2, beginning with uh, verse 1. And so follow along if you would. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, In the days of Herod the king, you remember Caesar Augustus is emperor of the world, Herod the king is king over this particular area, Um, behold wise men from the east now came to uh, Jerusalem. We don't need to go over the history of Bethlehem, you remember the name Bethlehem means what? means house of bread. And many people question, well why did they call it the house of bread? Well, many people believe that the fields around Bethlehem were very fertile because of all of the sheep. And so um, it was called the place of, of bread. It was the city of David, uh, where David was from, which answers the prophecy uh, concerning where he would uh, be born. Herod is king. Uh, just a little bit of information about Herod. He would reign for 34 years. Uh, he was half Jewish and half Edomite. Remember, Edomites were the descendants of Esau. And so he knew a little bit about a Jewish culture. He was a decorated war hero, uh, hence his name, Herod the Great. Whether people gave him that name or he himself gave himself that name, we don't know. But he was a tremendous builder. He had built up many of the cities uh, around Jerusalem, including the temple itself. Uh, almost one of the seven, if not one of the seven wonders of the world at that time, uh, the temple there in uh, Jerusalem. But he was also very cruel. Uh, he murdered his, one of his wives, one of his nine wives. He had her mother, his mother-in-law, the mother of the wife that he murdered, he had her murdered as well. He also uh, executed two of his sons, Uh, and accused them of insurrection. And so he was a very, what is it called when you're scared of everything? Paranoid. He was very paranoid about things. In fact, uh, he himself would disguise himself and go throughout the city of Jerusalem to see if there were any people talking about him. And if they were, they were caught and then arrested and executed. And so uh, he was very, very paranoid. At this point, uh, Herod would have about six years to live and reign as king of this area. In fact, um, at 70 years of age, he appointed some people particular people that at the moment of his death, those particular people would also be killed so that there would be crying and mourning at his own funeral. And so this guy was not only paranoid, but he was kind of a little off his rocker, especially towards the end of his reign. But there was, in spite of all of that, it was a relative time of peace there was no warfare going on at that time. And so wise men then came from the, the, from the east, uh, either from Persia or from Asia. Anything that's mentioned is, that's east is anything east of the Jordan River. But this seemed to be far away, perhaps maybe 800 to 1,000 miles away. They came from the east and moved their way west uh, toward uh, Jerusalem. Um, and so... Um, 
this is where they came to, but they were noblemen, uh, they were scientists, they were astrologers, they, they, uh, they followed the stars, they, they knew about the different religions, they would have obviously known about uh, the Jewish religion, and so wise men that would be coming towards Jerusalem, and we'll tell you why in a minute, but they would come there because Jerusalem was the capital, but it wasn't the main capital. I mean, obviously, Rome was the main capital. Uh, Jerusalem at this particular time probably had 80,000 people living in it. Uh, there are close to a million there t today. And so here we are now. The wise men have come from the east on their way to Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, And so they were saying... We're asking, and the imperative is used here, which means they kept on saying, they kept on asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now the question is there, how would they know to even ask that question? How would they know that there was a king of the Jews born in this particular area of, of Palestine? Well, there are, I believe, three reasons. Number one, we have to go back 700 some years when the northern part of Israel and all of its inhabitants were carried into exile by the Assyrians. And so Jews were scattered all over the area of Assyria. In 586 BC, the nation of Babylon would come in and carry off the southern part of Israel, known as Judah. They would carry them off into exile. And so there were Jews all over the non or the uh, the world at the, the known world at that particular time, and they would have carried with them their traditions and their customs, and obviously the scriptures, Genesis through Malachi as well. And so they would have been familiar with with the prophecies. Another uh, reason is uh, Daniel. You remember, five hundred years prior to this, Daniel was one of those exiles that were carried to Babylon. And you remember through a series of miracles, um, Daniel was elevated to second in command. And he was given charge of all of the wise men and all of the important people, the noblemen in, in Babylon. And there are many people who believe that as a result, Daniel formed a school in which they would train uh, the people that were underneath him. And so many believe that part of that training was also the Old Testament scriptures. And so people would have been familiar with the prophecies concerning uh, um, uh, uh, concerning this Messiah, this uh, anointed one. And also it was a Persian custom that if a bright light appeared in the sky, that someone important was born. And so those are what most people believe the reasons why uh, the wise men, these noblemen, these astrologers, these smart people, for lack of a better word, then would make their way west uh, toward uh, Jerusalem. It says here, for we saw his star when it rose. It's interesting that they use the word his star. Now the word star in the Greek means any bright light in the sky. It doesn't necessarily mean star. But they saw the star, and because of their customs and because of what they had read, they made their way westward from the east because of this bright light that was in the sky. And because of that, it deserved a state visit. And so these officials, whether they be two or three or much more than that, then make their way um, toward uh, Jerusalem. Uh, some of the Roman historians also mention the fact that there was this expectancy uh, that out of Judea uh, would arise a sovereign of the world. And so there would be a lot of reasons that would draw these particular men uh, toward Jerusalem. Uh, the rest of that verse says, For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And so one particular night, these astrologers get up, and all of a sudden they notice the rising of this star from the west to the east and pointed the direction. They researched all that they knew. Uh, they thought about the study of the stars and thought to themselves, you know what, this must be pretty important. We see it, 
And so we're going to follow it. Uh, there are a lot of um, physical explanations for it. Some people say, oh, it was just Halley's Comet. Or perhaps maybe it was uh, Jupiter and Saturn all lining up. And, and so there was this particularly bright star that we're going to just up and leave and follow for a thousand miles. On my way in this morning, as I was making my way, and it was about quarter till six, and I looked up in the eastern sky, and there was a bright star. It's Venus, right? The morning and evening star. But it was unusually bright this morning. There was no moon out, and all you could see was the stars. And so I'm driving, and all of a sudden I see the star. And then I, obviously I looked back again, <laughs> because I would have still been in the ditch over there. But there was this bright star, and it reminded me of what we're going to be speaking about this morning. And so I thought, man, there's the star in the east. Uh, where Venus was appearing early this morning. And so it must have been some sort of a phenomenon that would have, that would have drawn these, these educated men to come from Persia then there to Jerusalem. And it says, we have come then to worship Him. These are the questions that they're asking in Jerusalem as they arrive. And if you can imagine, as they arrived, they would have been dressed differently. They probably would have been riding camels. And so they would have uh, created quite a scene coming into Jerusalem, and they would be asking questions, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Uh, we have seen his star in the east. It's daytime. Perhaps they don't see the star. Perhaps, perhaps no one saw the star. We don't know, except for these wise men. We don't know. We don't have a record of any other kind of appearance back then. And so it, as they began to ask these questions, being dressed differently, um, verse 3 says, when Herod the king heard this, obviously this, this particular news would have gotten back to him. When he heard this, he was troubled, interesting, and all of Jerusalem with him. And so to ask that particular question, where is the one who is born king of the Jews, this would have piqued their interest. Why? Because they had been under the thumb of Rome for several hundred years. They wanted deliverance. They were looking for the deliverer. And all of a sudden, this news comes to town. These foreigners, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? This would have troubled many people. It obviously troubled Herod. Why? Because he considered himself king of the Jews. And so for this news to come to his ears, he was greatly troubled. The word actually means to be stirred up or to be agitated and disturbed. And someone who is paranoid, if that is a word, and someone who is suspicious of everyone, um, don't you know his curiosity was picked and his anger was probably boiling at, at the same time. You remember he's toward the end of his life. Uh, his health toward the end was not good. And then on top of all that to hear this news. And so what does he do? Does he go to Bethlehem? No. It says here, verse 4, And Herod assembled all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he asked them. The word there actually means to continue to ask. He wanted the answer right away. you got to tell me, religious leaders, you got to tell me, Mr. Scribe, what all of this means. He inquired of them where the Christ, you see, he was half Jewish, he knew the prophecies, where the Christ, this Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, where He is to be born. The priests would have been the priests that served in the temple. They would have known the Scriptures. The scribes were the equivalent of our uh, Supreme Court. They knew the law. They knew the prophecies that were uh, written in the Old Testament. So they would have been the ones that Herod would assemble and ask them, hey, what is this all about, uh, this King of the Jews? Uh, where is He to be born? The next verse, verse 5 says, and they told him, it doesn't say they went back and researched, let's go back and pray about it. And it says, immediately they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet in the book of Micah, their scriptures, and you both Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so they knew right away. My question is, why weren't they in Bethlehem when this happened? It's two years, almost two years now after the event. 
And here now the news is finally, and all of a sudden the light bulb comes off. You know what? That's what the scripture says in Bethlehem, in Judea. This is where the Christ, this is where the ruler, capital R, is to be born. And so they immediately knew. And I think it's interesting that they could point others to where the Savior was. But yet they couldn't even point themselves. The religious leaders, the ones who should have known better, the ones who knew the scriptures. But yet they were not the ones. But yet they would point these, these pagan astrologers from a thousand miles away to where the Christ child was. Not only that, but to shepherds. Remember, the shepherds were unclean. They weren't even allowed into the temple. It was announced to them they went to see Jesus. How come the religious leaders did not? It just amazes me that this would happen. The Son of God can't be born this way. Not in a stable, not there in Bethlehem. I mean, all of these things going through their minds. Verse 7 says, And then Herod summoned these wise men secretly. He didn't do it openly. He summons them secretly and ascertains or questions them what time the star had appeared. Did Herod see the star? Obviously not. No. He inquired, hey, what, what, time did, what time of day did you see this? this when, what, what week, what month did you see this star? He wanted to know when this thing happened. What time the star had appeared? And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may too come and worship him. You think that's what Herod wanted to do? I don't think so. You can see Herod bowing down to this baby and paying homage to the one who was to be king of Israel. Obviously, that's not why he sent them. Um, his intent was not to honor, but to destroy. We know that later on in the story that that's what, ha what happened. But, and again, my question is, why didn't he go? Why didn't he go at least with his sword and say, you know, if this is true, I'm going to kill this baby right now. Why didn't, wasn't Herod there? How come he asked this question? And the answer is given to them. He knew the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. But yet he doesn't put the two and two together. I always said that there's no one so blind as that person who does not want to see. Obviously, he did not want to see it. Verse 9, well, after listening to the king, the wise men, they went on their way. And behold, this, I find this is interesting right here. And behold, the star that they had seen before when it rose now goes before them. So all of a sudden, they, go, they leave to go to Bethlehem. It's only six or eight miles um, distance, and so they leave to go. Obviously, it's in the evening, maybe late evening. If it's during the day, you can't see a bright light. If it was, I mean, it was really a miracle. But the star, all of a sudden, they're on their way, and all of a sudden, the star then reappears to them, this miracle star. But this time, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them, Look at this, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. It didn't just point to Bethlehem. They knew where they were going. I mean, the sign says Bethlehem six miles. They knew where they were going, right? But this time the star reappears and points to the exact place where Jesus was. There were lots of houses in Bethlehem. Yeah, which house are we going to have to go door to door? Did people know that the Christ was there? Would people know? I mean... But the star guides them, right? The star that was, now is, right there in front of them. And, um, and I put to myself, and I wrote this down in my notes, you know, God will reveal himself to those who diligently seek him. You know, if you're going through a difficult time, you're going through a, a, a tough time, you know, you pray to the Lord and pray to the Lord, and in the right time, we looked at this last week, God will answer that prayer. God will appear and reveal that to you. Why? Because He loves us. Because He loves us. And sometimes He teaches us. And so those difficult times will teach... How many of you know what I'm talking about? Those difficult times will teach us and draw us closer to Him. Interesting, the star did not appear to Herod. The star didn't appear to any of the religious leaders. But it appeared to these pagan foreigners from a thousand miles away that would lead them exactly to the house 
where Christ lies. I mean, you know, I, th- I thought to myself, you know what? Back in the Old Testament, you remember when the children of Israel were in the desert? There was, what did they follow? They followed this pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire by night. And in my imagination, my feeble imagination, I can just see that pillar of fire, a bright light in the sky, pointing to the exact place where Jesus lay, the exact house. Joseph, did you turn the light out? How come it's right here? Now, did anyone else see the star except the the, the wise men that were there? I don't know. Uh, How many of you would love to have been there? I would love to have seen that. We don't know what time of day. Obviously, it's in the evening or, or night, you know, uh, before bedtime. It was only a six-mile journey from uh, Jerusalem, a couple of hours. As the star goes before them. I wonder which house it is, uh, Sam, you know. <laughs> so they're working, working their way, and all of a sudden, the star points to the exact house in which Mary and Joseph and the baby are. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, seeking to strengthen those hearts who are fully committed and looking for Him. I believe that the heart is desperately seeking for the Lord. God will reveal Himself to that person. God will reveal Himself. Like I said, if you're going through a difficult time, you hang in there and you pray to the Lord. God will reveal Himself. He will reveal His will to you. He will. So what happens? Look. Verse 11, and going into the house, I'm sure they knocked first. <laughs> you can imagine these three strangers going into the house. Joseph takes out the shotgun. Ah, you can't go any farther than this. No, they go into the house after knocking, I'm sure. And when they saw the child, the child with Mary, okay, it's not a baby now, it's a child. So it's a year or two after the birth. Mary and Joseph remain in Bethlehem. Renting a house, Joseph finds work as a carpenter, and, uh, and so here they are, um, and they fall down, and they fell down and worshipped him. In other words, they paid him honor. We have no record that they believed Jesus at that point to be deity, but the word worship here means to pay honor, which they would do to any political leader that deserved it. And so they bow down then to Jesus to pay him honor. Can you imagine Mary and Joseph's response? You know, they've already been told that this is the child of God. So far, Jesus has been perfect. He sleeps all night, right? (laughs) Doesn't aggravate Joseph or Mary and uh, hasn't sinned. You know, he's maybe approaching, well, in Jesus' case, it's not the terrible twos. (laughs) It's the perfect twos for Jesus. And they knock at the door, they see, uh, Joseph answers the door, Mary's back in the back with, with Mary, and, or with Jesus, and, and they bow down to worship him. And then they open their treasures, and they offered him, Jesus, gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Uh, gold is, the, is the, uh, the metal of deity, of kingly, of royalty. And so whether they knew it or not, they were paying honor to the king, capital K, at that point. And then frankincense. Frankincense was used by the priests in their times of worship. And the frankincense would be mixed with other incense and presented at the altar, altar of incense. It would be presented at the sacrifice so that it went up to God as a pleasant sacrifice to Him. And so unwillingly, unknowingly, they were offering the frankincense to the great high priest, Jesus Christ. And then myrrh, the third one, that was, uh, it was taken from a tree. It was a bitter, a bitter resin that was used in the embalming process. So whether they knew it or not, again, they were presenting this to Jesus in preparation for his death and burial. Myrrh is also mixed with wine and and given to alleviate pain. Remember when it was offered to Jesus when he was in the cross. And so unknowingly, they were picturing Jesus, the king, the great king, the great high priest who would suffer for us on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven. And now they didn't know this. We had the advantage of looking back and, and seeing, well, that's exactly what was happening here. You see, God doesn't make mistakes. Whatever God does or allows to happen, it's not a mistake. It doesn't take him by surprise. God knew 
these gifts and what they stood for. Verse 12 says, and this is where we'll finish, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And so they, they were sleeping somewhere. Did Joseph have room in his house? Hey, sit down by the fireplace here and just kind of rest your feet for a while. They fell asleep. War, they were warned in a dream to not go back to Herod, but to go back another way. And the dream had to be convincing enough to make them go another way. They didn't know, right? How many of you had a dream that when you wake up, your heart is really beating? I've had some crazy dreams, which I cannot repeat here. But you wake up and your heart just really is really, really beating. And so I'm sure theirs was as well. We had this dream, guys, you know, we can't go back to Herod. He's going to do something terrible, and so let's go back uh, another way. And so that's what they did. We know later on when the news got back to Herod that uh, the wise men did not come back to him. He found out all of the information. What did he do? He issued a decree that every child under the year of two was to be killed. And so there's a prophecy that talks about the, the weeping in Rama and, and the prophecy concerning the mothers who would weep at the result of their children being killed, their male child being killed, thinking that it was the Messiah. Terrible, but God delivered them from that. Let's finish off with this. When you tell people about the truth of Jesus Christ, they will respond in one of three different ways. Number one, they may respond hatefully. How many of you know people like that? When you bring up the name of Jesus Christ, it could be family members, it could be friends, co-workers, and they will just lash out at hate at you. I've seen people like that. I've experienced people like that. And um, I mean, and if you didn't, no self-defense, you'd be on the ground with a bloody nose. You know, it just, uh, they hate the message. They hate the truth. Go to the, our nation's capital in D.C. and start preaching about Jesus Christ and see what the reaction is. It would be venomous. So some people will react that way. Some people will react with indifference. That was the religious leaders. Uh, well, that's okay for you, but that's not okay for me. Our churches are full of people like that. You know, they're, they're hearers of the word, but they're not doers. You see, the religious leaders knew. They knew the word of God. They knew the prophecy, but they did nothing about it. As a religious leader, I mean, I would at least like to investigate it and see. And so some people you may talk to will just respond indifferently. You know, that's, that's okay for you, but it's, it's not for me. And then number three, there will be some like the wise men who will take it and they will just respond and they will follow the star. They will follow that answer. So I, I, so I guess the, the, the just is this, don't give up. Especially this year of 2024, we all know people who don't know the Lord, right? Don't give up on them. If they react bitterly, say, God, give me a strategy so that I could reach them. If they react differently, Lord, help me to, be, to have the wisdom to be able to respond to them, to show them, to point them to Jesus Christ. And if they're like the wise men, rejoice with them. <laughs> because, you, you know, ten people you may witness to, maybe one will respond to Jesus Christ. That's the one you need to rejoice in, right? Let's pray for that this year. Let's pray for people to come and... and um, will find a Jesus Christ. You know, God's will is, first of all, that we would come to know Him. That is, this is His desire. Secondly, God's will is that we would have fellowship with Him. I believe one of God's greatest desires is that you would get to know Him in an unbelievable way. And how do I do that? Through prayer and through reading the Bible. That's His greatest desire, to have fellowship with you. I believe God's heart broke when Adam sinned. Because the fellowship that was there, that when Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the garden, all that was broken because of sin. Man, get into your Bible this year. Use that book if it'll help you to get into the Bible and, and read and find out what God has for you. And then talk back to Him. Somebody said the other, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, yeah, you do. You're talking to me. I'm just a peon. You know, just talk to God. You can talk to anybody, right? Just talk to God. It, prayer is just talking to the Lord. And so develop that relationship. I would not know Johnny Brophy unless he talked to me and I talked back to him. 
And the more we converse with each other, the closer we get, right? That's the same thing with our relationship with the Lord. He speaks to me through the Word of God, and I speak back to Him through prayer. Man, develop that relationship with the Lord this year. No, develop your fellowship. The relationship's already been established, right? Develop the uh, fellowship with the Lord. And then number three, I believe God's will is that you would use the talents and gifts and abilities that He has blessed you with and investing them in people. It's hard to do. It's the most rewarding thing that you can do. To take the gift, the gift that God has given you, and to invest them in a person, and then to see that person respond to Jesus. It's hard to do in school, I know, Peyton. It's got to be hard. But you take it, you're embarrassed, aren't you? (laughs) But that's all right. But taking a stand for Jesus Christ in school, in college, Reagan, when everyone else says no, I say yes to Jesus. That's a hard thing to do. But this year, by God's help, I'm going to do it. James there in, 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 in Forest Middle School. Are you in high school next year? Oh, gosh, I can't believe it. No, you're still this small in my mind, in my heart. But anyway, take a stand for Jesus publicly. Take a stand in your workplace, in your retirement, in your community, in your family. Sometimes the family is the toughest place to take a stand. But do it this year. Man, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be my best for you. I've made resolutions before, and I blow it the first week. How many of you know, you don't have to raise your hand no matter what I'm talking about. But just, God, that you would this year draw me closer to you. Help me to be effective for you in my walk and in my talk so that when people see me, when people see you, they will see Jesus not easy in our culture. We live in a, a culture, Lee, was, we were talking earlier about it. quickly our culture is changing. By the way, Lee, raise your hand. Uh, Lee, Anthony, in the back. Uh, if you know anything about the history of our church, uh, one of the first pastors of this church back in the early 1800s was Anthony. Last name was Anthony. He's a descendant of the early pastors here. What a legacy. If you want to know anything about history, Lee's the one you want to talk to. He had me spellbound with his stories of, of history and uh, anyway I'm going off on it are we still recording I'm going off on a tangent hey guys and uh, so anyway let this year be that year that you draw closer to the Lord and bring others with you if Jesus comes back and he could that trumpet sounds Man, I want, when I stand before the Lord, to see people next to me that I had at least had an influence in bringing into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's truth. That's where I want to be, whether I'm a young person or an older person. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. Amen? I think that's it. Let's close in prayer. Then I have a couple things to say. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for your love to us. Lord, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We just celebrated his birth. Thank you so much, Father, for what you have given to us and and done for us. Lord, we're here this morning because of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Father. What a great God we serve. Go with us this day and this new year. Lord, may we commit ourselves to you Father, to to be more like you and that people would see that difference and want what we have and then we can point them to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Father. We love you. In your precious name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Lee Anthony, Lee.